Zechariah, but a Zechariah this morning. Say Zechariah. It's in the Bible. Great kid's name, Zechariah. Zach for short. Three, uh, chapter three, verse one and three. The Bible says this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan was standing at his right hand to accuse him. Come on, the insolence of the enemy just standing there in the presence of the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I've taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. That's an encouraging scripture, just reading it this morning, right? But I love this story here. I want to preach from it for a few moments and then create some space to pray for people. I really believe that God's going to kind of get into your life and, and do something amazing this morning and people are going to leave different uh, than the way they came. But I love this story. And in this story, Zechariah has a vision. He has a number of visions, but he has a specific vision here and he sees Joshua like dressed in paru clothes, like he's got, I don't know what he's got on his clothes, dirt, vomit, I don't know, use your imagination, the Bible doesn't say, but he's dressed in paru clothes, I'm sure he's smelling, just adding a little bit of color and license to the text this morning, but he's standing there like stinking, dirty, paru, dressed in these dirty clothes, and then Satan's standing there, he's standing in the presence of God, right, and then Satan is standing there, and the Bible says Satan is accusing him. He's condemning him. He's judging him. He's pointing out his failures and saying, hey, you did this. You're useless. You're a failure. You call yourself a Christian. Come on, ever heard that voice before? Eh? You know, like, he's like, man, he starts to lift his hands in prayer. What are you doing lifting your hands? You don't deserve to be here. And, and the enemy's up in his face condemning and criticizing him about his past. And I recommend that's the nature and personality of the devil, right? He wants to get into your face and accuse you about all the things that you've done wrong. Come on, that's what the enemy does. In fact, the name devil is, the, is literally the Greek word diablo, which means accuser. The enemy is there and he's saying you're a failure, criticizing, condemning, judging. In the presence of God, and the Bible says that the Lord interrupts that and starts to defend him. You know, the name devil means accuser, but the name Jesus means savior. And, and come on, how many people are grateful that we serve a God and his name means savior? That's what he does. That's his personality, man. He wants to come into people's lives where there's condemnation and accusation and failure and shame and condemnation and, and just and lift that and defend and stand between you and your accuser. Revelation 12.10 says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And he stands before God day and night. He doesn't even take a break. He's on day duty and night duty. He's like day and night standing before the people of God. This is one of the ways the enemy wants to undermine your faith. Because while you're feeling bad about your past, it's hard to come to God and expect good things. It's hard to, to walk in an expectation of God's favor Come on, and God wants us to live with this expectation of favor. It's like David, man. David wrote this in Psalms. He said, goodness and mercy, they're chasing me down the street. I remember being in South Auckland once, and I, um, when, I, when I got my first car, it was a Mazda 808, like an RX3 without the rotary, rotary, which, by the way, makes all the difference. And, um, and so I remember driving down on the motorway, and I accidentally turned and cut off this guy. And, man, he was an angry guy. Like, it was an accident, honest accident. He pulled a knife out, a machete, actually. He pulled a machete out. He started waving his machete. And, man, I just started, like, I put my foot down, man, in my 808. That thing was redlining. I was hoping to get pulled over by the police. And then I was, like, driving, and then I, bang, just cut off on the off-road and up through Papakura. And I was just like, and then my, like, I'm, a, I'm normally an E for enough kind of guy on the, 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 the light come on. And now I'm even freaking out even more. And I'm just like, man, I'm taking all these things and like running some red lights, trying to get away from this crazy guy, man, just for cutting off. And he's like, man, I'll get you, I'll get you out the window of his car. 
I just think, man, that's what David's talking about. But, but instead of like a mad guy with a machete, it's goodness and favor, goodness and mercy following him. And that's how God wants us to live, man. You are on the run from the favor and the mercy of God. But the enemy wants to bring accusation into your life. So you can't believe God for anything good. It's like um, Isaac, you know, he goes through all this drama in his life. And he gets to this point in his life where he says, everything is against me. And he just can't expect for any good thing. He's lost his kid and who wasn't lost, but kind of just crazy story, all these things happening. And he's like, everything in life is against me. Come on, the enemy wants to bring so much drama into people's life. You stop believing God for good things, hey? And so, um, you know, th this is what we see, accusation, criticism. But the Lord steps in and the Lord rebukes him. And the Lord takes off his filthy clothes, puts on clean clothes, and restores him. He says, he's a, he's a man. He might not look like much, but he's a stick that's been snatched from the fire. Come on, I wonder, have we got any sticks that have been snatched from the fire in the building this morning, man? I'm a stick that God has snatched from the fire before I got fully burnt. A little bit damaged. But he snatched me from the flames, eh? And I'm grateful for him. See, what we see in this passage is we see the enemy stepping in to say shame on you, and we see God stepping in to say shame off you. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to preach on the thought, shame off you. If you turn to your neighbor and say, shame off you. Don't get it mixed up. Don't get it mixed up. Say, shame off you in Jesus' name. I believe God wants to do that with some people this morning. He gave me a word on purpose for some people because he wants to lift the shame of your past off you so that you can start moving forward into your future, eh? You know, I heard this story a little while ago about a guy who was driving on the road and his car broke down, true story. And he pulled over to the road, over to the side of the road, started trying to fix his car. And um, a guy turned up in a limousine, pulled up next to him, got out, had a black suit on and some white gloves. He walked over and said, hey, do you mind if I take a look under the bonnet? I kind of know a little bit about cars. The guy said, yeah, go for it. So he took off his white gloves and got in under the bonnet, started to tinker with it. He said, try start it up. After a couple of minutes, boom, the car started up straight away. And the guy said, hey, what do I owe you for it? And the guy that fixed it came back and said, hey, my name's Henry Ford. And uh, you don't owe me anything. While well, he's putting his white gloves back on, you don't owe me anything. I, I can't stand driving what, past one of my creations that's broken down on the side of the road. Come on, and that's the nature, that's the nature of your father. Is that, man, shame will get you parked up on the side of the road of your own life. Shame will get you being a spectator of your own life. But God's saying, man, I'm going to pull over and only take him a couple of minutes under the bonnet, and he'll lift the shame off you so that you can get going. And I believe God wants to do that with some people this morning. He wants to get you rerunning with purpose in your life. Come on, with vision and destiny in your heart, running for the cause of Christ. Wants to get you moving. You know, sin is deadly, eh? Heard someone say once that sin will fascinate and then it'll assassinate. Come on, it'll thrill you, then it will kill you. That's the nature of sin, eh? And sin is deadly. Is that, man, sin will bring bondage and darkness. Sin will destroy your relationships in your life. Come on, some of you are looking at me like you've never sinned before. Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Like, oh, where's he going with this? Oh. <laughs> Come on, sin will damage your life. Sin is sin for a reason, right? Yeah. But, but you know what? I reckon shame is more deadly than sin. Because when you sin, if you sin, you can run to God. And the Bible says that if you confess your sin, it's the, that, that Greek word literally means if you say the same thing that God says about your sin. In other words, if you stop making excuses for it, come on, if you stop justifying it, come on, I feel like preaching this morning, man. If you, if you stop like blaming other people and you just put your hand up and say, yeah, I did wrong. I know I shouldn't have done it, Lord, but this is here I am. And you bring it to God. The Bible says that God is just and he's faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just forgive you, but cleanse you. Not just forgive you so that you're standing in the presence of God with dirty garments on, but to cleanse you 
so that you can stand before God with confidence. Come on, I reckon we need a praise break this morning. Can we praise him for some forgiven sin? So sin is deadly, but shame is more deadly. Because when a person comes under shame like Adam, he sinned, and then the enemy's voice comes in straight away. And then he starts to cover up his own nakedness. And he starts to hide from the very God that wants to heal him. And he's hiding through, like we hide with all sorts of things, right? We hide with trying to be successful in work. We hide with like relationship. We hide through material possessions. We can hide through ministry activity. Come on, we can try and hide our shame through all sorts of things rather than just coming to God as we are and say, God, here I am. And God's like, Adam, where are you? Not because God couldn't find Adam in the garden. It's because Adam couldn't find Adam. Come on, Adam was lost, so God comes to him and said, where are you? We've got to bring, see, shame is more deadly than sin, because when we come under shame, we end up hiding from the very God that wants to heal us. Which is why in church, I'm passionate about creating environments where, pe- where there's no judgment. I'm passionate about creating ministry teams and and small groups in church where there's no judgment. Because as soon as there's judgment, people criticizing one another in the room, people start withdrawing and hiding. Come on, as soon as families start criticizing one another, instead of people being real about where they're at, they start hiding where they're at and they end up dying in the darkness. That's why Jesus in Mark 3, he walks into church on, on a Saturday in the, in the synagogue, and there's a guy standing in the back of the room with his coat round like this, hiding his gammy hand. Like he's hiding his hand. His hand, the Bible says his hand is crippled. So he's got a deformed, damaged, dysfunctional part of his life that he's hiding, and he's standing in the dark at the back of the room. Jesus walks in. The first thing that he does is he silences religious criticism. Because he knows that this guy isn't going to get healed. He isn't going to bring what's in the dark into the light while there's criticism in the room. So he silences criticism. And then he, Jesus is like the kindest, yet at the same time, most brutal person you'll ever meet, eh? Come on, anyone know what I'm talking? He's like love. Man, he's grace for like for miles. But he's like truth at the same time. And so Jesus is like, hey, bro, at the back in the dark, you want to come up? Yeah, you guy with the kind of withered hand. You know, the one you think nobody can see. Yeah, come up, bro. Like, come up, stand up in front of everyone. Calls him to the front of the meeting. And then he says to him, he's got his hand here. It's all crippled and he's hiding it because it's kind of like you pull it out and people are like, oh, that's like, oh, man, bro. And so he's like, <laughs> he's hiding it. It's not the kind of thing you, you, you go over to someone's house for dinner and you like go over and they put the food down and you're just like, it's kind of not the thing, it's not the thing you do. And so you keep that thing hidden, but Jesus calls him out in front of everyone and then he says, I want you to stretch out, take out from hiding, take out from the dark that thing that's with it and bring it into the light. And the Bible says as soon as he stretches out his hand, he gets healed. That's the power of taking something that's in the dark. Man, I feel like there's a whole bunch of people that don't want to acknowledge they got a withered hand this morning. Like you come into church. I know that person sitting next to you looks holy, but don't be fooled. (laughs) Don't be fooled, man. I know they dress real nice on Sunday morning, but don't be fooled. They got a withered hand. Come on, Jesus wants to call you out, not to shame you, but to heal you this morning. That you'll bring that thing that's in the dark into the light. You know, I was thinking about, I was thinking, you know, when you're old, like start getting old, there's multiple reasons, <laughs> which I will not go into, but you know, like, you know, when you, like, like I did this wedding yesterday and man, I remember like dedicating Kiani. I'm like, man, you're starting to get old, you know, like, when the analogies you use, like I was thinking about this this week, and it'll work for everyone over 40, but just apologize in advance for the rest of you. But I was thinking about how we used to take photos back in the day with cameras that had film in them, right? Anyone remember that? 
some of you guys say it's like some of you you don't even want to put your hand up, eh? Hey? Hey, bro, pastor, like I don't remember, I don't know what you're talking about, man. It's always been digital. And um it's back in the day when you had to be careful about taking pictures because you only had 25 a roll. And so people would put these uh, rolls of film into a camera, believe it or not. They also had like CD players, <laughs> tapes even. Come on. But, but anyway, like they would put this film into a camera and they'd take a picture and the picture would create a negative on the film, negative image, an imprint on the film, an inverted image. And then they would take that image into a dark room, had to be a dark room to develop that image, and they had to keep the light away because the light would destroy the image on that, that negative image on that film. Come on, I reckon that's the enemy's strategy in people's life, right? He wants to take a picture of your worst moments, create a negative, then he wants to convince you to take what you've done and keep it in the dark. And he knows that if he can keep that thing in the dark, it'll develop a, a permanent image that will have authority over your life. But God, God's just saying, come on, bring that thing into the light this morning. Take that negative image and take that, that moment, bring it into the light before the Lord. And he will break the power of your past over your life. I was driving to work one day. I was, I was on my bike and I didn't have a helmet. And so I, I just... I'd be riding, and I, I, I had a helmet, sorry, I didn't have a visor. And so it um, sounds worse than what it was, eh? It was, a, it was a helmet. And I'd look up, and I'd kind of like the rain went into my eyes. And so I was like this. And then I looked up, and there was a truck broken down in the middle of the road. So I went to, went to turn with my lightning-fast reflexes, like the Flash himself, and, and I slid off my bike, bang, straight into a parked truck. It sounds really bad when you say it out loud. Like, how did you break your leg? I drove into a parked truck. But anyway, that was my story. My leg went over my, my, my shoulder. Long story short, ambulance come, ended up in Middlemore Hospital. I can still remember a 17-year-old lying on the hospital bed at Middlemore Hospital, and a police officer came up to me and said, hey, how fast were you going? I was like, definitely under 50 kilometers an hour. It was true. And then the next thing he said was, we're going to give you a ticket for failing to stop. <laughs> he wrote me a $50 ticket for failing to stop. I'm like, bro, it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> like, bro, my, man, and I reckon that's what the enemy wants to do. There's some people and you've had a fall. And I want to tell you, there's life after a fall. Come on, but, but you've had a fall and the enemy wants to come in and write an infringement hey, and penalize you and kick you while you're down. Come on, some Christians will do it for the devil. But come on, don't be that guy. You know, we're going to be people that lift people up, that encourage people, that are people's biggest champion when they're going through difficult times. So I want to share a couple of thoughts on getting free from shame. First thought is that shame will stop you from receiving. Shame will stop you from receiving. Joshua 5 Verse 9 says, the Lord said to Joshua, today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and they'd been beaten down, they'd been oppressed for so long, they'd internalized that and had a sense of inferiority, a sense of shame. And sometimes when you've been abused for so long, you start to feel instead, you, you start to feel like you're just, you're not good enough. You've got the sense of overwhelming sense of shame and failure in your life. You can even believe that you deserve what was, what's been happening to you. And not, not only are you ashamed of what's happened, you can become ashamed of who you are. And that's how the Israelites felt. And, and God brought them out of slavery and led them to the border of the promised land. But before he could lead them in, he had to deal with their shame before they could step into the promise. Come on, it's the same for us, that God's given you some great and precious promises, but before you can step into that, you've got to deal with shame, otherwise you'll never be able to believe for God's goodness in your life. Second thought, don't let one negative event become your identity. Don't let one negative event become your identity. I heard this story about a uh, famous baseball player, Bill Buckner, and he played for the the Boston Red Sox for years and had, had an amazing track record of just success. And one season, he hit like 
he scored the most out of anyone across that whole season in every baseball team. So pretty amazing guy. I mean, in 1986, during the World Series, he went to field a slow ball, and he went down like this to, to field a slow ball, and, and instead of catching it, it was just a slow ball rolling along. It rolled straight between his legs, and he missed it. And they, they ended up tying that game, going on to lose that game, and the team that they lost against won the World Series. And so this guy was just like hammered. He got hammered by kind of everyone. You think that we're bad on the All Blacks. These guys were terrible on this guy. Just like calling him out and, and just talking about how he let the team down, let the side down. Time magazine wrote this. Let me quote. Despite a lengthy career that included winning the National League batting title in 1980, he's best known for making an infamous error in the 1986 World Series. So people just remembered that one bad play. Come on, he had done some amazing things. He made one mistake and people remembered that one, bad, that one bad play. Come on, that's the nature of humanity. That's the nature of the enemy is that he wants to use your one bad, he wants, to, wants you to overlook all the kind of home runs, all the kind of amazing things that have happened and focus on that one bad thing so that you live your life disqualified. It's like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Doubting Thomas. And, you know, Jesus had 12 apostles and, and um, they were doing amazing stuff. Jesus died, was, he rose from the dead and he appeared to a number of apostles, but he didn't appear to Thomas. And so they went back to Thomas and said, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas is like, unless I can put my finger in his nail marks and my fingers in his side, very specific, I won't believe. And then Jesus turns up and he says, hey, bro, come here and put your fingers in my nail marks and your hand in my sides. And then he rebukes him and says, stop doubting and believe. But everyone refers to Thomas. A lot of people refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas. You know, the Bible never calls him doubting Thomas. Preachers call him doubting Thomas. The church calls him doubting Thomas. But God doesn't call him doubting Thomas. But I love Thomas because he refused to let that eight-day period of unbelief define his life, he ended up taking the gospel further, historians will say, further than any of the other apostles. He took the gospel all throughout India because he wouldn't let that one eight-day season define him for the rest of his life. Well, I just want to, I got a simple message this morning, right? You know, maybe it's nothing you, you haven't even heard before, but, and I just want to encourage somebody, don't let that that moment, don't let your, your worst moments disqualify you from the future that God has for you. You might have blown it, but God hasn't changed his mind on you. Moses thought he blew it, you know, but God turned up when he was 80 years old and say, he said, come on, let's go, Moi, we're going, man. It's time to go change the world. 80 years old, God turns up and says, come on, this is the time, this is the day, let's go. We're going to go change the world. God doesn't define us by our mistakes. He refines us by our mistakes. Come on, last thought this morning is that sometimes you need to forget some things to move forward. Sometimes you need to forget some things. Sometimes you need to forget some things that other people have done to you to move forward. You know, some people say, oh, I can forgive, but I can't forget. And there's some truth in that, you know, like I get that. But sometimes you just got to discipline your mind not to go there in order to move forward into the thing that God's got for you. Listen to what Paul says. You know, this is for everyone that says, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Listen to some scripture this morning, Philippians 3. One thing I do. This is the Apostle Paul. It's in scripture. I forget what's behind. And I know there's some things that have happened, some things that you've done that are hard to forget, right? And we can learn from that to move forward. But sometimes in order to move forward, we've got to say, I'm just not going to remember that. I'm not going to choose to meditate on that. I mean, I could remember it if I tried. I might pull it up every now and then if it's useful for me. But I'm not going to live my life meditating on the past so that I can step into my future. He says, this is one thing. This is Paul. He's saying, I'm only doing one thing. Come on for those one jobbers out there. One thing I do. He says, I forget what's behind and I strain towards what's ahead. I press towards the goal to win the prize 
to which God's called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What an amazing thought that God, who is all-knowing, chooses to forget forgiven sin. Like Mark said, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes our transgressions from us. God, who is all-knowing, chooses not to remember forgiven sin. Let me finish with this story and caught up with a friend of mine this week and was actually sharing at staff meeting about a story and how he, when he was a younger guy and his kids were young, he, he had a full-on week, but his wife wanted to go to like Mount Bruce, take the kids to Mount Bruce. So he drove over to Mount Bruce and it was a full-on day after a full-on week. And he's driving back to Palmy. He's, he's tired. And he's like, man, I just got to push through and just make it home. And so he's coming into Palmy, haven't got long to go, starts dozing off a little bit at the wheel. He can feel tiredness coming on, but he's like, man, I can push through this. And he tries to push through it. He ends up falling asleep. His car swerved onto the other side of the road and into the, into the ditch. And he woke up, boom, with toy toy all through the car and people screaming and kind of this full on traumatic moment. It was full on. His kid, one of his kids had to get rushed to hospital. And like he's feeling, you can imagine, he feels terrible about that, right? Like, He's a dad, he's supposed to protect and provide for his kids, but he's kind of ends up almost killing them. He's like, man, this is full on. And he just tried to shake it. But that thing was kind of like in the back of his life for years. And then a couple of years later, he was in a church service like this. You know, he's still involved in ministry. He's still serving. But somewhere nagging him in the back of his life is like, man, you failed. You failed your family. You failed in this situation. He was in a church service like this, and the Lord spoke to him and said, I've forgiven you. Who are you not to forgive yourself? And just in a moment, like only God can, eh? Like someone can say that, and it's like, yeah, cool, bro. But man, when God speaks into your heart, just says, boom, something shift. And he just felt, boom, this freedom, this, this shame, which I believe is going to happen for people this morning. You know, like you've been coming in, you're carrying stuff. And even as I'm preaching, you're like, man, I know I'm carrying some stuff. That's stopping me from living for God. I feel like maybe you feel like you're that parked car on the side of the road, spectating your own life and disqualifying. There's this voice in your mind just disqualifying you from the future that God has for you. But I really believe that God once gave me this message so that he can set you up for a moment where things are going to change. How about we stand to our feet this morning? And Thanks so much for joining us today. Legacy runs weekly Sunday services. We also run a number of ministries helping the poor. We run an addiction program, a significant social housing ministry, and large community meals, helping show the love of Jesus to our city. If you would like to partner with us, just scan the QR code on the screen or visit us online. Have a fantastic day.